The conjunction of spheres, the monoliths, multiverse, chaos, monsters we've never seen before, the wild hunt, Laura Doran, elder blood, what does it all mean? Hello, my sweet summer children. I'm back with the juice to get you through the long night. And Witcher season two has come out and there are hookers in Caramorn. Okay, so the whole, I, I'm appalled. Nah, seriously. Like, I was like, what the hell? What the hell? None of this makes sense. And can we just talk about how weird Vesemir was? Like, what? Also, the idea of Renice beating Triss and Vesemir. Bruh. This video is going to be kind of weird. It's going to be kind of weird. Kind of going to be kind of all over the place because I'm conflicted on so much. But overall, like, I think The Witcher season two was great. Like, it's amazing. Like, Henry Cavill. Like, I just want to drink the sweat from his ball sack. But, but, but I can't help but think I loved a lot of this. But at the same time, I didn't like a lot of this. I actually hated a lot of this. Um, there were hella, 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 hella changes. And some of the stuff just doesn't make sense. Some stuff, I just, I just didn't like it. Overall, it's still good TV. Like, it's good TV. But me personally, I love The Witcher books and cannot recommend them enough. The game as well, especially Wild Hunt. I can't help but think... Like y'all changed an astronomical amount of shit. But sometimes, sometimes we just got to appreciate these adaptations for what they are and what they're trying to be. But in this video, I will be doing a breakdown of season two and I'll be going over some book things, a lot of Easter eggs, just trying to explain some things, all of the juice. I'll try to keep the spoilers minimal and go over certain things in depth in separate videos. So let me know what you want me to go over in depth in a separate video because I'm going to do a lot of Witcher videos. I already have three already done so let's go so the very first episode of season two picks up right where season one left off first we get a clip of Nivellin's house and the travelers arriving and being killed by the brooks of arena episode one is titled a grain of truth and a grain of truth is the title of the second short story in the last wish i have a complete breakdown of that short story and i'll link it below also i think uh this series in comparison to the books is a grain of truth like there's a grain of the books in this series <laughs> i think episode one was like the strongest episode of the season and was immediately followed by the weakest episode of the season which was episode two but let's just talk about this series so we cut to the aftermath of the battle of sodden it's one of the biggest battles to go down and it's very important in the books we don't see the battle but we hear about it and the aftermath of it and we know that the effect it has on the story it's a huge battle unprecedented scale like thirty thousand people die and Nilfgaard is defeated, which actually causes them to fall the fuck back and stop pressing north. So Taseya is looking for Yennefer. She's seeing visions of the battle through the Fallen's last memories. Geralt, Rolch, and Ciri pull up looking for Yennefer. Can I just say, some of the cinematography, I just love it. Especially the shots of Geralt and Ciri in the snowy woods. I mean, the, cin the cinematography, the CGI, all of that is amazing. But anyway, back to like the dreams. So Geralt asks Ciri about her dreams. She describes like the fall of Sintra and tells her about his dreams. A rock troll, overly friendly. I think this is a game reference. When he said it, I immediately thought of the game. The trolls were my favorite part, especially the friendly ones. I almost never fought the trolls unless it was like self-defense, of course. But this wasn't the only game reference. The wolf medallion we see in Kara Morin is definitely a game Easter egg. But anyway, Geralt explains the law of surprise to Ciri, which is how Ciri became Geralt's destiny. This backstory is explained in the short story in The Last Wish called A Question of Price. Pavetta, Ciri's mother, was a child of surprise and Ciri was a child of surprise, which means they were both marked by destiny. Does lightning usually strike twice or is something special going on here? So we find out that Yennefer has been taken by Fringilla in the real world. Ha, <laughs> not. Yennefer's storyline pissed me off so bad. And I'm going to talk about that as well. But before we get to that, Siri and Geralt are on their way to Kara Morin. And they stop at Geralt old friend house, Nibelin, and Pox on it, Pox on it. So the short story is, of course, different. When this happens in the books, Geralt is alone. Siri is, of course, not with him and she's not even born and Nivellen is not an 
old friend. But I'm glad that they included this short because I think it's fundamentally important to their overall season as a whole. So when Geralt mentions the abandoned village, Nivellen blames this on the Wild Hunt. And we wind up seeing the Wild Hunt more times during this series. The Wild Hunt is first brought up in the short story Shard of Ice in the second Witcher book Sword of Destiny. The Wild Hunt or the Wraiths of Morg are like the big bad of Witcher 3, but they also appear in the main book. So Ciri actually has visions of them in Time of Contempt and the starry-eyed daughter of Chaos Bit is right from the books. I'm not going to get into too many spoilers in this video about the Wild Hunt, but my next video after this one is an in detail spoiler filled video all about the Wild Hunt. Are they ghosts or something else? The Wild Hunt is actually pretty fucking terrifying. But anyway, Nivellen is blaming the Wild Hunt, but there is actually a Bruxa in the house, Verena. A Bruxa is like a siren vampire bat. Another fun Easter egg from this episode was the tale of Lara, the fall of the elders. Lara was basically an elf that fell in love with a human and they were persecuted for it. This is Ciri's ancestor. This is where Ciri's elder blood comes from. We see Lara when Tr Chris and Siri go inside Siri's mind. But the importance of a grain of truth, the short story, in my opinion, it really boils down to one quote. There's a grain of truth in every fairy tale, said the Witcher quietly. Love and blood, they possess a mighty power. Wizards and learned men have been racking their brains over this for years, but they haven't arrived at anything except that. That what, Geralt? It has to be true love. So this season opens up with some magical curse being broken by blood and love. And it kind of ends the same way with Yennefer basically sacrificing herself for Ciri, breaking a curse, love and blood. But I'm going to just say it right now. The whole deathless mother plot was not in the books and I really fucking hated it. But anyway, we're on to episode two, Kara Morin. And let me just say I hated episode two. It was the worst of the entire series and it made made like the least sense and it sets up a lot of the confusion in the following episodes like this deathless mother thread just fucks shit up. It opens up with Frangilla and Yennefer being taken captive by the elves. I knew they were going to probably take liberties with Yen's story because they are adapting Blood of the Elves and Yen isn't with Ciri and Geralt until much later in Blood of the Elves. But I must say I feel not only was Yennefer's storyline the worst, the elves storyline was awful like the the elves the woods witch i just okay so we meet francesca and why they made her into a baby killer when she's quite the opposite like i don't know none of this makes sense francesca is not a squirrel she's not pregnant she doesn't have a baby the way they made emir kill her baby and then for revenge she goes to redania and kills all of these redanian babies when we know spoiler she actually lies to protect some very special redanian babies it's like they take these characters especially the elves who are motivated by politics and survival and make them into one-dimensional supervillains I don't get it. So Phil Evandrel is there. You may remember him from season one in the episode the in the episode that adapted The Edge of the World. Um, the Edge of the World is actually a short story about Phil Evandrel. Frangilla, Francesca, and Yennefer go to meet the Deathless Mother, Hut One, Hut Two. Hut, what the fuck was you thinking? The Deathless Mother is not a thing in the books, and it kind of dumbs down the elven plot in the books. Like, I just hate it. It's like some creepy woods witch gave out some riddle, and that caused the elves to join Nilfgaard. I think, like, the exact line Frangilla says is Francesca claims the old gods want an alliance between the elves and Nilfgaard. But basically, the northern kingdoms are racist towards the elves, as you've seen throughout the series. The northern kingdoms basically slaughter the elves, and some of the elves join Nilfgaard not because the Deathless Mother tricked them into it, but because Nilfgaard gave them a home and, you know, the Northerners were slaughtering them. So they joined Nilfgaard because it politically was what was good for the prevalence of their race. Like they did it for survival. Not a witch in a hut in the woods told them to do it. In the books, some of the elves or squirrels are called Soaya Pale. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but they're basically like forest bands of like gorilla elves and they are aligned with Nilfgaard and like the idea of Kahir or Nilfgaardians training them to fight is fucking laughable. Gorilla warfare tactics are insane, like Kranig men shit from A Song of Ice and Fire. None of this makes sense. 
So like the Northern Kingdoms, like I said, they were oppressing the elves, making their ex existence impossible. And I just feel the elven storyline is told much better through Geralt and Ciri. Well, through Geralt telling Ciri about Elarina and the Rose. And I'll do like a separate video on that because I don't want to spoil all that. Anyway, so we reach Karamoran with Ciri and Geralt. Vesemir is there and the other witchers. Everyone is home to winter at Karamoran, the school of the wolf. And somehow hookers are there and it's like little fingers, brothel and flea bottom. Karamoran is literally in the middle of nowhere. Like one of the most highly inaccessible places in this fucking universe. You can really only access it from the witcher trails. It's a grueling process to get to Karamoran and it's stupid for like party girls or whatever it, it's like stupid for them to, to be there and it literally doesn't make sense but I get it it's not that big of a deal to me it's not that big of a deal because it's immediately overshadowed by the way they did Eskel first of all witchers are pretty immune to infections that's one but two why the fuck would you kill Eskel why Eskel is very much alive in the books if you just needed like a character to further apply and kill off then you should invent one and my trying to understand this episode I look up why the showrunner killed Eskel and this is what she said we knew we had to kill someone in that episode the very first version of the script we wrote was a brand new witcher we had never met before all of a sudden we were like oh our audience is going to meet Cohen and Lambert and Eskel and John who's gonna die John's gonna die Girl, that was a good idea. Great idea even. So what happened? So she continues and she says, um, we thought about it really hard. I know there are fans that love Eskel and I feel like, why would we do that? And they feel like, why would we do that? But honestly, his death is what changes everything for Geralt, blah, 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 blah. Which to me still really doesn't explain why you killed Eskel because if you've never read the books or played the game, you don't even know who Eskel is to know of his value or Geralt's emotional attachment to Eskel, or how Eskel's death would heighten importance around events for Geralt. Like we just met him in the show with all the other witchers. So you literally could have killed a red shirt for the same effect. And also Eskel would still be alive since he's still alive in the books. And also Eskel is not a fucking douchebag like douchey McDoucherson in the show. Um, my breakdown... I hope it gets better. Like, I hope it's just not me whining, but this episode just uh, like the series, th this kind of pissed me off. Like I like it and I want to love it, but it's just it, these deviations for no purpose that just make everything worse are really, I don't, I'm having flashbacks to Game of Thrones. Anyway, the elves being dumbed down, Kara Morin being like a frat boy house and Eskel being treated like some red shirt throwaway. I, I didn't like the episode. I didn't like that episode. But let's get into what's going on at the heart of it, everything. Let's make sense of all of it. Let's try to make sense of all of it. So in the beginning of the episode three, uh, what is lost? Istrid is being questioned about Nilfgaard. Istrid cares more about the monoliths. So let's talk about the monoliths for a second. So the monoliths aren't a thing in the books, but they do appear in the game, but like not in the same kind of way. So they appear as like, a key to open a tower not as like a key to another universe in the show the monoliths have been like repurposed so they are like gateways to new dimensions and they were caused by the conjunction of spheres i feel like i'm not sure but i feel the show might be mixing the monoliths with the intersections which are kind of like ley lines places where you can draw the force in the books like, I feel like they might be using the monoliths as stand-ins for the intersections. But anyway, the conjunction of spheres, like, occurred 1,500 years ago, trapping ghouls and goblins and gremlins and vampires and such in this universe. According to elves, this is when the humans arrived. They arrived during the conjunction because their home was destroyed. So, yes, the Witcher world is a multiverse. I feel in the show, the world building has been a little meh. Like, for example, Sintra is here. Kara Morin is here. This means that Yennefer rode all the way to Sintra to... This means that Yennefer rode all the way from Sintra to Kara Morin, yelling, Geralt, no, wait, Geralt, no, wait. And that's like like a long fucking journey, like multiple days. Anyway, this journey reminds me of like the Gendry running to Eastwatch and sending a raven to Danny shit. But I mean... I guess they're kind of going out of their way to not communicate how far away these places are from each other. So it makes a little more sense. I don't know. Anyway, we have Vilgefortz 
like, what are they doing with Vilgaforts at this point? We have Vilgaforts, Tissaia, Stragabor, the whole kit and caboodle, going on and on about elves and the elves joining Nilfgaard. Yennefer has returned to Arachusa. Now, Yennefer's story is all made up. In the books, Yennefer doesn't go all fiery magic y mage during the Battle of Sodden. She does, however, like save Yasker. She isn't called the savior of Sodden or anything like that. And she clearly never loses her power. She does temporarily go blind. But why they needed Yennefer to lose her power, I don't really understand. The whole betrayal of Geralt and Ciri, it doesn't work for me. There are, like, they're a family unit. Ciri is her daughter. It's crazy. But we aren't there yet. Can we all just agree that Stragabor hates women? Like, he completely got Renfrey killed. Now they have him just, like, being a dick at Eretuza. He's plotting on Yen and claiming Falco was like so awful. Like he just hates women. Stregobor in the books doesn't have this role. Like he only appears in the lesser evil, but he talks about like a woman named Falca. Falca was actually the daughter of the King of Redania. And her story involves Rhiannon and Rhiannon is Laura Doran's series ancestors, you know, the elder blood. So Finn from the, uh, from the series actually thinks that Falca had the elder blood as well. So we know that Siri has it, Laura Doran, Pavetta. So what is elder blood and what is the Ithilene's prophecy? So the elves were kind of acting like the Bene Gesserit from Dune. They were selective breeding, basically genetic magical program. They were trying to create this all powerful person who's powers would be greater than their own and it would save their race this gene that they created was thought to have died out with Lara but it didn't and it's in Siri so Ithilene the prophecy of Ithilene let's talk about Ithilene for a minute Ithilene is an elven healer legendary magical shorty from around the way she was this she was famous for her abilities she predicts a ton of things that came true but Ithilene's prophecy is about the sword and the axe's nigh, the era of the wolf's blizzard, the time of the white chill and the white light is nigh, the time of madness, the time of contempt, the time of the end. The world will die amidst frost and be reborn with the new sun. It will be reborn of elder blood, of hen ikar, of the seed that has been sown, a seed which will not sprout but burst into flame. This it shall be. Watch for the signs. What? What signs these shall be? First, the earth will flow with the blood of Aip Sedai, the blood of the elves. I probably didn't say that shit right. But anyway, this is deep shit, right? But it's basically about Siri. And I'm thinking because of Ithilene's prophecy, like the reason they're keeping Stragabor around is because Stragabor is going to like preach how Siri needs to be killed because he did the same thing with Fr Renfrey. He's coming for Yennefer. So I'm pretty sure Siri will be on his hit list. So they changed the story so much from the books. Like, I don't even know what's going on at this point. None of this makes sense. I personally think like they added like the monolith and the deathless mother to like serve several purposes. Like they wanted more Yennefer than what was present in Blood of the Elves. They wanted to do more than just like sit in Karamoran or sit in the temple with Yennefer. To, like they wanted more action and they wanted to show like series importance and they wanted more monsters. However, I don't think it works because it has such an impact. Like she's literally the big bad of the episode. Renice is literally nothing. And the way they decided to just like do her just like it changes so much so we know that Siri is special we start to figure that out and during the series she's doing witcher training at Kara Morin in the books Vesemir actually sends for Triss to help with Siri and boy did they butcher a Blaviken Triss's character they butcher a Blaviken her so in the books Siri like falls into these trances and something is trying to communicate through her possess her so Triss decides that she's going to enter Siri while she's in one of these trances and she does and whatever is happening Triss is not power and powerful enough to help and so then she encourages Geralt to get a more powerful mage Yennefer Triss says entering the mind of Siri again would be as dangerous as her taking on the trial of grasses speaking of the trial of grasses Vesemir was really about to put Siri through the fucking trial of grasses one of the most cringe episodes of the witcher or moments of the witcher was when Triss flipped out on Siri and like basically said you're gonna end the world and then ran away like then there's this whole thing about the reason we can't make any more witchers is because the elder blood and the mutagen gene is gone first of all what like the school of the wolf isn't the only wolf. So if you're going off like some nightmare of the elf, 
So if you're going like off of the nightmare of the wolf thing where you're like, oh, oh, Karen Morton was sacked and all the mutagen antigen is gone and we can't make witches anymore. Like the school of the wolf isn't the only fucking school. Like there's the school of the cat and the viper. But to think that Bessemer and Triss would allow Siri to undergo the trial of grasses, it's it's idiotic. Anyway, fast forwarding here, like honestly, I'm going to have to do individual individual videos like on a lot of this because at this pace, I'm going to be here all day because I haven't even got started on Vilgefortz. Like, Vilgefortz and Tissaia? <laughs> Vilgefortz and Tissaia. So anyway, anyway, Geralt takes Ciri to the temple and Yennefer is there. One of the most book accurate Easter eggs was like the unicorn that was broken under suspicious circumstances. Yeah, Yen and Geralt banged on it and broke it. Also, that dear friend, um, that dear friend thing, or she's a dear friend and dear friend, and she turns around. That was a reference to the dear friend letter. I have a whole video on that, um, on Yennefer in period, just on Yennefer. So watch that. It's called Lilac and Gooseberries. Anyway, Yennefer is going to take Siri to the Deathless Mother and to get her power back. Carol interferes. Siri becomes possessed, and none of this happens in the books. Why? Like, why did they do this? Some mild spoilers here. Yennefer and Siri and Geralt are family. Siri is the child that Yennefer never had. Of course, when Siri first meets Yennefer, she doesn't like Yennefer. When Siri first enters Yennefer's care, she plots to run away from Yennefer and back to Kara Morin. Geralt is not at the temple when Yennefer gets Siri, and, and Yennefer isn't nice to Siri. Yennefer is Yennefer, right? She calls Siri the ugly one or a surprise. Yennefer mocks her quite often, but that's Yennefer. Like, they grow a bond, but I can't help but think how does mocking her turn into trying to kill her? And how is Siri realistically supposed to overcome that kind of betrayal? But either way, season two like this video was all over the place and then they revealed that Amir is Siri's father and this is interesting because in the books he's adamant that no one find out that he is her father and the reveal like that shit doesn't happen till way 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 down the line so I think they are likely going to change his motivations which would fit the game more I don't know I'm not gonna get into too many spoilers in this video but this video is also incredibly long and I don't think I'm making much sense so I will be doing a few individual explanation videos comment below what you want me to do videos on in the witcher verse also let me know what you guys thought of this season I really hope that they do better for season three because this was a hot mess but I still loved it because it looked good I want more Dandelion scenes. He's the best. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks to everyone that supports me on Patreon. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please click that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and join the sweet summer family. Okay, my sweet summer children, have a good day.